Welcome to the Big Honker Podcast brought to you by Boss Shot Sales. I'm Jeff Stanfield. I am Andy Shaver, and on the line with us today, we've got the one and only Mr. Ira McCauley. How are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good. The sun's shining. Turkeys were gobbling this morning, and uh, even though the wind was blowing 35 to 40 miles an hour, I still got my hat on my head. Now, when does y'all season open up? Uh, our regular season opens the 19th of April. Wow. That's quite a ways away still. We open, yeah. we open up Saturday and mm-hmm. ours is the latest we've opened in a couple of years. See, they moved I, it back think so. a, I think last year we sent mm-hmm. them in March. Might've been, but, um, but y'all are quite a bit further North than us. So, I mean, are, what are your birds doing right now? Are they kind of peaking? Are they, are they just now getting started? How are they acting right now? Oh yeah, they're just getting started. I mean that that big late freeze, man, it really set a lot of stuff back. And um, our turkeys, well, at least the turkeys around my house just started gobbling. Shoot, I mean, within a week, and uh, so they're just starting to look for the hens right about now. And there's still absolutely not one leaf on any tree. There's really still no buds on any of the trees. Uh, all the understory is still wide open. Um, I leave to go hunt in southern Illinois on Sunday. It opens Monday, and I think they've got a little more vegetation starting down there. But, you know, you, some of these early seasons that open in the Midwest, like Kansas and all that, I mean, the early hunting can be tough just because, golly, they just pick you out so, so bad, you know, if you're trying to run a gun. You better have some sort of little something to put up in front of you because they will pick you out on the front side of a tree over and over. How do you do it? Are you a running gunner or what do you like to do? Yeah, man, I'm a total minimalist when it comes to turkey hunting. So it's generally me and a shotgun and a call. No decoy, no nothing. I mean, here, like around my house, it's all big river hills. Um, there's very few fields, and the and the woods are hyper mature. I mean, you can see through the woods 200 yards, and uh, and there's not a whole. I mean, there's turkeys, but there's not a whole lot of turkeys. There's no pattern to them, so you almost have to run a gun, or else you just might go the whole season not even be in the game. You know. What this late freeze that you talked about? Have you noticed uh, it killing off any turkeys? Because it was a big freeze. It was a big one. Yeah, I wouldn't really know that. Um, I know I put corn out for them when, when it got so cold. And one day I went down to where I, I kind of fed them there. And there were eight toms sitting in the snow like 75 yards away. And I'm shoveling corn out of a bag <laughs> back of my truck just trying to see if I can help them out. They never even got up. They just sat there. And uh, so, I mean, they were definitely, you know, struggling. And then... I noticed on the snow geese, I mean, they were, you know, it, it warmed up good, and the snow geese just kind of lagged behind. You know, I think they got hit so hard in Arkansas, I think it really sapped them. And, uh, you know, even once we started, and they should have been coming, they were they were delayed in getting up here. And then the, a lot of them were really just pretty poor, you know. They didn't have very much uh, meat on their breasts, you know. And and uh, I, think it put a, I think it put a number on on the birds for sure so where does it that was one thing jeff and i were talking about where do the snow geese go i mean you can't go any further south than i mean louis where do they go you can't south texas you going into mexico where did these birds seek refuge i've I've shot them in mexico but you know they're so programmed in the spring to want to come north they don't they don't really like to go south especially not way way south and I think a lot of them kind of got stuck, you know. I mean, Arkansas got that 15-inch snow, and it went all the way down to Texas. There was really nowhere for them to go, you know. They just had to friggin' wait it out. And I know it killed a lot of ducks, 
I don't know. I didn't hear many big reports of a bunch of geese getting killed, but I'm I, but I'm sure it was really tough on them. You know, they said South Texas. The uh, what is it? The redfish. The redfish. The, the trout are real bad. The redfish are not as bad, but the the speckled trout. They've had to change their limits on. But the live oaks in South Texas. It's wiped out a bunch of live oaks around San Antonio, and we got cactus here yeah. that is just that were mature, mature cactus, big stuff. I mean, four foot, four and a half foot tall, and it's wiped all them out. Man, that's wild. I mean, that was a major, major storm. I wish it would have hit. Have one, for God's sakes. I wish it would have hit during hunting season because I think a lot of questions would have been answered. You know, right now the hot topic about every two years is the flooded corn and what it's doing to the birds. I this 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 storm would have answered a lot of questions from guys that are in southern Louisiana. Did the flooded corn did y'all lose a bunch of birds on flooded corn up there or had y'all turned the water off on most of it by then? Uh no man. They they leave. They leave. They they don't stick around when it when it freezes, you know. They go to the river, they go south. I mean, everybody's got this misconception down south. I shouldn't say everybody, but that, you know, flooded corn, some magic silver bullet. Mm -hmm. And if you plant it, the ducks get in it and they can't ever leave it and all that. But that's, that's definitely far from the truth. I mean, we have everything, you know, we have flood woods and WRP and, and managed moist soil and flooded corn and dry corn. And when it gets cold, those ducks go to the river and they, they hit the dry cornfields, the ones that stick around. They don't they don't use that flooded corn then. So when it gets cold, they go to the dry corn then. Yeah, or they go south, yeah. Did y'all did, did you happen to notice if the birds I'm assuming the river did the river freeze up? Well, our river, you know, it, it moves pretty fast, the Missouri River, so it it never really freezes up. Like you might get some ice flows that kind of lock up certain areas. I mean, it's got to be really cold for that to happen. But generally, what's happening is that you know ice chunks, maybe you know the size of you know they might be twenty, thirty, forty feet square, and of course smaller. They're just going down at seven miles an hour, and the ducks will hop up on those and ride down a couple miles and fly back up and land on another one and float down. So. You know, it doesn't freeze solid. Um, it just gets icebergs in it. That's interesting. You you had one of the most interesting stories that I've ever read about your Satori that you lost in the turkey woods. That's fascinating. Mm. Fascinating that yeah. it came back into your life. Tell me that story. It's I've never miracle. heard it. It's a miracle. But can you tell it? I, I've never read that story. Sure, man. So when I was in college, I bought... The first factory dipped camo satori. It was dipped in shadow grass, I believe. But it was the first, first one they ever did. I worked at Bass Pro in Columbia, which is old. I don't know if you guys ever watched David Letterman, but you used to always see him post liquor guns and ammo. Yeah. Well, I liquor guns and ammo in Columbia, Missouri. And um, so we could buy guns, you know, off the list or whatever. One of my good friends, the Browning Winchester rep. So I got that gun. And I, you know, when you're young... You don't have a lot of guns. You have one gun. That's your hunting gun. And so I used it to shoot everything from doves to ducks to turkeys to sporting clays. goes on and on. And so, you know, I started turkey hunting when I was like 20 years old. And I shot every turkey with that gun until I lost it, which I would have been, man, let me think here. I don't know. I probably would have been. 35 or 40 when I lost it, probably 35. And uh, so I shot a turkey that morning and I went and got the turkey and I was about, oh, a little over half mile from my truck. So I go back to my truck and, you know, I go to the office, I'd work and clean the turkey and I go to go turkey on the next morning and I go to get my gun and my gun's not in my truck. I'm like, what in the world? I mean, I know I left it in my truck. And so I'm like, well, maybe I took it in the office. So I go back to the office, no gun. I'm like, God, surely I didn't leave it up in the woods. I wonder if someone stole it. So I'm like, well, maybe I left it up there. I can't imagine. So I walk back up to, I find the pile of feathers where I shot the turkey. I think I find the tree 
where I was sitting against and there's no gun. I'd, I'd gone to the bathroom somewhere on the way back, probably set my gun down. And of course, God knows where that was. And anyway, I can't find the gun. So I call the cops and file a, you know, stolen gun report and give them all the info. And so three years later, my buddy who's place, my buddy, that's my neighbor, he owns like 3000 acres. And, and, uh, I get a call from him. He says, Hey, uh, found the guy found your gun that was shed hunting today. I said, you gotta be kidding me. He goes, no, it's leaning against a tree barrels up with water all the way up to the barrels. <laughs> no way. So, you know, we have the Browning, uh, you know, Browning's not their factory, but their uh, repair shops here in Arnold, Missouri. So I took the gun there and so I'd, I'd left it in the woods for three years and then they had it for two or three years and they put new wood on it and, you know, re it, but it still had all the pock marks in the barrels, outside the barrels, all that. So, you know, all the metal's got a ton of character. When they re when they restocked it and put a new forearm on it, they put this beautiful grade six English wood with an English stock. And I mean, the gun is gorgeous, but the, the dang thing shot like 18 inches high. <laughs> and so I back and I was like all right I've got I want to kill my hundredth turkey with this gun so I'm only going to shoot this gun until I get a hundred and so you know I it'd be a year and I might you know shoot three or four and miss three or four because you'd have to aim at their toes to kill them you know especially if all you could see was their head it's so hard to aim at the dirt right. and not aim at the turkey and so I finally killed my hundredth turkey I don't know a few years ago and I was so happy to put that gun up on a on a on a mount there on a peg and never have to shoot it again. I mean, it weighs so much and and it shot so high that uh, yeah, I'm happy to carry around some sub gauges now. But but uh, but in that gun in the stock, I, I started putting a little brass nail in for every turkey that I'd shot, and so I've got 108 of those on one side now, and then. Uh, I started putting them on the other side for my older son. So there's three on the, on the other side. That's, that's very cool. That's fascinating. What, what happened to it that made it shoot 18 inches high? Just the way that they restocked it? Yeah, I think, you know, when they put that, you know, it was a hunting Satori. Mm -hmm. So it had an style stock on it. And I guess when they put that English style stock on there, I don't know, whatever it is, that sucker shoots high, high, high. So, I mean, if you're not... Think, you know, if you just snap shoot, you're going to miss. There's no doubt about it. Um, so you've got to, like, bear down and then go down to get that turn. You know, if, if I'd have put the the brass nails in there from the time I got back until I finally killed a hunter for all the misses, I would have run out of room. <laughs> I've missed turkeys, and there is not a more deflating feeling in the world than going through all that work and getting that bird to play your game just to come up short in the end. I'll tell you my worst miss story with that gun. I went up to uh, our duck farm and it flooded. So, I mean, you know, it had just flooded. So you talk about everything is a muddy mess. I mean, it's ugly. Everything's covered with silt. I mean, it's just a disgusting deal. And the creek was real high. And uh, so I, my, my family was there. I think it was Easter. So, you know, I get up and... I go go down to the farm, and our, our duck farm isn't a good turkey farm. There's not many I'll go down there and listen, and I, I heard one. The only bird I heard was across the creek, and so I sat down and tried calling him across, and he wouldn't budge. So I was like, well, I'm going to have to go to his side. So I went back to the house, and my brother's daughter had a pink horse raft there, so like a pink pony raft. So I blow this raft up, get my waders, go back to the creek, throw the raft in the creek, slide down the bank, land on the thing, you know, <laughs> pass across with old Satori, get to the other side, get up the bank, and then make a move on this turkey, get down this corner, and here he comes, okay, so he's coming. And so I hear him gobbling, he's coming from, let's say, this way. And then I see him, and he's he's over here. And, I mean, I'm, like, dead to rights. There's no – there's no daggum twig, you know. Everything's black. And 
I'm like, man, I'm going to have to try to make a move. So I try to make a move, and he sees me. And, of course, at that point, instincts kick in. So what do you shoot at their waddle, you know? And, of course, I missed him twice. And, uh, you know how sickening a feeling it was, how deflating on your manhood when I had to get back on that pink pony <laughs> and paddle after I missed that damn turkey? Oh man, I I don't have any stories that can top that, but I've had some that are just it's a layup. Like just make a good shot and for whatever reason, um I always shot uh Benelli Nova. Pump, I was a pump guy through and through. And uh there's been a several times I got the old I got the click and it's rack one and try to get a shot off and by the time you do that it turkey's gone. I mean forget about it. It's tough and it's amazing to me. I'm I'm not, I'm an okay shot, but how the hell on the second shot you've got this big ass bird flying in the air, and I shoot teal and ducks and everything else. How I miss the turkey flying away from me, this big target. I, I'll never I'll never figure it out. Never figure it out. Yeah, that's not the way you want to shoot them. They can pack a load, that's for sure. How'd you get into waterfowl hunting? Uh, well, my grandmother on both sides, well, my grandparents on both sides, both lived in very dyed in the wool, historical waterfowl hunting locations. So, uh, my, my dad's or my dad's parents, uh, they lived in Katy, Texas. So kid, you know, we grew up. And we didn't have a decoy, a duck call, nothing. You know, we just had a gun, and we grew up past shooting snow geese and speckle bellies and jumping, you know, uh, reservoirs and all that stuff. And then uh, my mom's parents, they lived in Sulphur, Louisiana, which is right by Hackberry, so southwest Louisiana. You know, back in the day, that was like major, major, super great waterfowl spot. Um, my uncle worked for Terry Shaughnessy which was Hackberry Rod and Gun back in the day. And so, you know, I was fortunate. My dad, he took us hunting a lot when we were kids. Uh, we grew up in South Carolina. There were no ducks there, essentially. We, we shot deer with dogs there. But every, you know, every holiday, we'd go down and go, go duck and goose hunting down at, uh, at the grandparents. You know, we'd go see one and hunt there and then go see the other one and hunt there. And then that's when Jeff first started in business, Katy, Texas was the place to go. Yeah, it was. Larry it was. Gore and uh, Third Coast Outfitters, and hell, there was 50 outfitters down there. And now there's yeah. hardly any birds go down to Katy. Development. Right. It got, uh, got overdeveloped. Now nothing goes down there. Um, so, man, last time I was there um, was for my grandma's funeral. And, uh, man, a lot of the places we used to hunt were daggum subdivisions, and there's a huge bass pro. I mean, it's just, it's a different world now. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's just, it's developed. What did you, uh, how was this waterfowl season for you? Did you get to go out more? Or was it less? How was the hunting also? Uh, I went plenty. I had COVID in November, so I called that corn green. I hunted every day for, like, I don't know, three and a half weeks straight or something. And, uh, but you know, this year was the fourth year in a row that our ducks have been super early. So like normally we'll have some little ducks, you know, end of October. We don't normally get many mallards at all until somewhere between the 10th and 15th of November. And this was the fourth year in a row that we had so many ducks the Second or third week of October, it was unbelievable. And um, youth season last year was October 24th. We didn't open until November 7th. And we had so many ducks at the second, third, fourth week of October. I mean, they they did a, they did uh, flew a count on our, our personal place. Oh, man, it was the end of October, and there were like 47,000 ducks on our farm, which is 420 Ooh, acres. Sure. So, I mean, the, you know, the, the migration was super early for the fourth year in a row. We had very few major migration events after that. The weather was really stale. The ducks were super nocturnal. There was no rain. 
there wasn't much cold weather. There was just nothing to get them out of that pattern. So like even when we'd get a couple cloudy days in a row and a little bit of rain, you know, that rainy day, they might shake up a little bit, but there was not enough of a change to make the ducks do something different for the majority of the season. So the mornings were tough. A lot of the mornings were tough. The afternoons were, well, they're pretty tough too, but you know, at least, at least you'd have a shot at killing some ducks in the afternoon. You know, we, we refuge south end of our place and let's say we had, I don't know, pick a number. Let's say we had 15,000 ducks down there and you could hear them all day and you wouldn't see a duck in the air until maybe 30 or 40 minutes before shooting time. So many days this year, like, I mean, that's, that was kind of the story of the season, which we don't have that very often in, in a lot of years. This is probably the worst I remember it ever being like yeah. that. What do you think is making them go nocturnal? Because I've heard so many people talk about that. We had Lee on, Lee Chos on a couple weeks ago, and he said, everybody is saying that these damn ducks are nocturnal now. Man, I, I, I think that a lot of it was just that they showed up super early, like really early, and they they had, they were so familiar with the area. And, but I think the biggest thing was just so little in the way of weather yeah. changes. So, like, if we get a big rain, man, it's like you take the deck and you just throw it on the table and shuffle it all back up. We had no rain. Um same thing when we get a big cold snap. You know, those ducks can't stay in their same deal. they got to do something different. And then you've got a shot at them when they change back, and then they change back and start exploring again. Um, this year, the weather was just so stable and so nice that there was no weather event to make them do anything different than what they'd been doing. And I think those, for us, I think those were the two factors that, that just really, you know, made it a tough season for us. Because we had, I mean, we didn't have as many ducks as normal, but we had plenty of yeah. ducks. That's it, that's interesting that you say that because I can, you know, down here in Texas, I I hunted in t-shirts more often than probably not this year, and like you said, you get that anomaly, you get that cloudy day, and it's like new freaking birds. It's just insane. I mean, because you know it's always sunny in Texas, but you go, you get a cloudy day or something's got a little bit of drizzle to it. And like there were actually birds that I could that I could kill. I felt you know, felt halfway like I knew what I was doing on those days. But we need weather. We need winter again. Well, like for us, we just need change. It, it doesn't have to be winter. We need something that's going to make those ducks want to go explore and do something different. You know, we just didn't have that this year. Whether it's you know, rain or cold or just any sort of change. I mean. Getting cold and then warming back up, that's a good change. Getting a big rain that gets sheet water out or a flood or whatever, that that makes them do some different stuff, you know. But when it's just like Groundhog Day over and over, they know they know where they're staying during the day. They know where they're going at night, and they're just not doing anything different. You know, I really had high hopes, uh, selfishly, whenever we heard that Canada was going to be closed. I just really thought that it was just going to be – a migration like we'd never seen before. There were going to be all these dumb birds here. And that, I was wrong about that, big time. We all were. I mean, there was a lot of, I mean, Lee and I had conversations about that. And, uh, but, you know, those ducks left Canada early this year. I mean, we had that big front, like, you know, right around the 20th of October. We had so many dollars, 20th of October. It was crazy. And, um, you know, I don't know my personal feeling, and this is based on nothing other than being out there a lot, was I don't feel like we had a great hatch. You know, they didn't buy any surveys and all that due to COVID, but man, there, you know, there were a lot, we shot a lot of ducks. There were a lot of ones, twos, threes, fours. We had very few days where we had nice flocks coming in, which is a little unusual for us. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm used to at least having, you know, a good solid double digit number of days where we, we've had, you know, multiple big flocks get in there. And this year it was, it was lots of, 
you know, lots of ones, twos, threes, sixes, just, you know, the, the 20, 30, 50, 100 bird flocks were super few and far between. I think they're off on their numbers. I really do. I think this, the feds are way off on their duck numbers. And I don't know. All I can tell you about, like, our area, we call it the Golden Triangle. And uh, normally we'll have between, we'll normally winter between a half a million and a million birds there, like at our peak. And, uh, man, I think the highest cumulative this year was was under 300,000. You know, now I'm not saying that those ducks weren't somewhere else. Maybe they didn't get here. I don't know. But uh, but just historically, you know, it, was, it, it our area was below what we normally have on our three main places that are served. Yeah, I think the numbers were way, way off. Water. Like, they were scattered around somewhere that, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of places for the ducks to be like there are some years. But I mean, we talk to people with this podcast. We talk to we do like a public land segment, and we talk to people from all over the country, and nobody has said that they saw the birds that they are otherwise getting reported to be around. Nobody, any no no corner in America. Yeah, you know we didn't have the. Uh... You know, we didn't have the data compilation last year that we normally do. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm hoping that there were a lot of ducks that stayed north with that stale, warm weather. And and, I, and there, I've had some reports that, that support that um, in Minnesota and South Dakota and Nebraska that, you know, maybe a lot of our ducks that we winter just didn't get here, yeah. you know. Now, how did you fare with COVID? You said you had it in November. Did you have a bunch of uh, ill effects? Man, I was I was sick. You know, I for nine days I felt really, really, really terrible. And uh, tenth day I felt a little better, and then I got better. And then about a month later, I started breaking out in all these hives and having this crazy cough, and I had to go back on prednisone again. Um, I even thought about going to the doctor Uh-oh. for God's sakes. I mean, you know, I I thought about that. <laughs> Things are terrible. If a, if a man's going to go to the doctor, he's sick. But hey, I still run it every day. But I got some. A couple of the spots don't require much energy, for God's yeah. sakes. Did so you didn't take Ivamec? <laughs> no, but you know I didn't know about that little thing uh, when I had it. But if I had, I certainly would have. I've got plenty. I of took it. it. I had COVID, and I thought I did. I didn't go to the doctor, but I knew that I did. And I took that stuff, and I felt like crap one night. I had a fever all night long. Woke up the next morning, didn't feel good. And I took that. A buddy of mine has show pigs, and he gave me some. And I took some, how many cc's, and drank it. And I took that, and I took something else. I can't remember what else I took. But I took some pig medicine. And I tell you what, four hours later, I felt fine. And I was tired for a week. That was the worst thing I had was tired. But that Ivamec, I felt it knocked out the, the cough and all that crap. That was it. I wish I would known about that, but, uh, you know, I had it. I, I didn't hear about it until I was already recovered. But, uh, yeah, man, the only thing that kept me functional was Dayquil. I was taking Dayquil like every four hours on the hour. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was pretty rough. Um, but, you know, I, I'll take I'll take a lot of crappy days to get to go duck hunting every Jeff day. Jeff had the rip-roaring shits for a couple of days. But, Woo! you know, I, I other, that Ivamec is not, mm. you know, it's not for human consumption for a reason. Mm. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll keep that in mind next time I need to take it. Maybe I'll get it wormy and have to take it at some point. Well, Andy, also, he had Mexican food the night before. I ate Mexican food the night before. It was a bad combination, but I didn't have to go on a ventilator or nothing, so it turned out to be really good. Hey, they say if you take Bachelor, you get an erection and grow a tail, so I wouldn't try that. (laughs) Uh, And and then I had it, too. I I couldn't smell or taste. That's how I knew I I had it. That's all I had, though. And still to this day, I still can't... uh, smell or taste dang i'd take that in a heartbeat yeah, it, it's weird my my wife the other night she cooked something and she was real proud of it and i'm like oh i guess so if it tastes good i don't know can't and i remember for like you know at least a week all i ate was like watermelon and apples and oranges just because you know you could feel the texture i dang sure wasn't gonna eat any pasta or anything like that i was, I, I was scared i was gonna choke on it do you think that the canadian border will be open this year with with everything that's still going on 
God, in today's world, I doubt it. These damn politicians, you know, they're so friggin' they're doing everything they can to keep things closed, seems like to me, so I'm not very optimistic. I, I hope so, just because we have a business up there, but um, man, you know, I, I, I'm not I'm not very optimistic about yeah. it. Yeah, what, I mean, what, what was the policy this year with you guys, for guys that had hunts booked up there? Did you roll it over to this year? How did y'all navigate that? Yeah, yeah, we just rolled it over and you know, hopefully we'll get to go. Hopefully we'll get to go this year. But what happens if, if it doesn't? Do you roll it over another year? I mean, you know, if there were guys that were adamant about, hey, we want we want our deposit back, and, you know, we'd do what we could to, you know, make it work for them, that's for sure. I mean, you know, a lot of our clients are not spring chickens, so, you know, if God – needed his money and wanted it, we'd try to accommodate yeah. him for goodness sakes. See, and you guys are in a unique situation because you you could do that. A lot of these guys that are up there, those deposits are gone. I mean, there's nothing at this point to give back for a lot of the outfitters that are up there. It's a, it's a tricky situation. I don't know what guys are going to do. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, that's just a small part of our business, luckily, but uh, – you know, I mean, golly, everybody misses going to Canada, whether you're a DIYer or someone going with a guide. So hopefully, uh, hopefully they, you know, open their eyes to the fact that we're getting vaccinated and herd immunity from exposure and all that stuff and start loosening things up. A I saw, bit. I talked to a guy from Canada yesterday, a friend of mine, and he told me that the rumor is they're fixing to lock them all down again. And I know that they closed Whistler Mountain in British Columbia. You know, they closed their whole mountain down, all the ski, and they just shut it down again, I guess, yesterday or the day before. And they're shutting everything down again up there. Well, I mean, Canada's progressive, so, you know, who knows what they're going to do. All about control. How, what are, what are your COVID laws in Missouri? Like, are you guys still masked up, or are you all pretty well, pretty much free to go? In St. Louis or Kansas City, it's pretty much just business as usual for the most part, unless you go to Walmart or some major chain store, you know, grocery store. But I don't know. I'm in St. Charles County, so there's no mask, nothing here. I mean, um, you go to St. Louis and it's like mask mania. And so, you know, if they really worked, everyone on this side of the river would have COVID, which most of us do and no one in st louis would have it which they've all had it too so i mean you know it's not like it's not like there's some big big disparity between each side of the river based on what's going on you know but no most of missouri has been fairly lax for the most part unless you're in i think the city. it's that way everywhere in the united states all the small towns and stuff Anywhere in the Midwest, or basically hardly any mask at all, other than the first month when nobody knew what everybody thought they was going to die. But you go to the big cities and you like, see masks everywhere. Yeah, St. Charles County. I mean, nobody even walks in the restaurants with a daggum mask on anymore. You know, but we in the veterinary world, um, we've been curbside. Everybody has since it all started, and. Uh, we had a, an employee meeting the other day. A lot of our employees are getting vaccinated, and I think our goal is to try to open our doors back up and start seeing some people that want to be seen in the office uh, in June. Have you liked that as a veterinarian? Not, I mean, kind of having people out of your office or not? Well, it makes me way more efficient. <laughs> uh, crazy. I mean, you know, we had to add six more phone lines, but... Uh, but for Ira, I mean, I'm not sitting there talking to people about, you know, all the things in life, which I'm not saying that's good, bad, or indifferent. But when it comes to, like, getting stuff done, I can get a lot more done in COVID because, you know, uh, I'm just a lot faster. My That doesn't go – our support staff's busier, but the veterinarians are more freed up. You know, you're just not having conversations as so much. You or not so you're going out to a car and you're looking at Fifi the dog and you're doing the exam in the car basically? No, no. Our our tech goes out and gets all the information, brings the dog inside. We do all our stuff, and then like if I've got questions for him, a lot of times I'll just call him and and kind of get that figured out. 
and we'll do all our stuff and then I'll bring the dog back out and kind of talk to the people about what I found and whatever else and, and go from there. But, um, no, it's, we're not seeing them curbside. We're just having the social interaction. Okay. I got you now. Cuts out a lot of bullshit. Yeah. (laughs) It cuts out a lot of the, you know, just people love to visit, you know, I mean, it's, it's part of being a veterinarian, you know, it's a social, it's a social job, but, uh, when you've got umpteen drop offs sitting in cages back there, it's nice to be able to knock them out, you know, while your tech's doing this or that or whatever. I think that I think people are more proud of their animals than they are a lot of their kids. Would you say that's true? <laughs> Probably should be. <laughs> yeah, that's no shit. Yeah. Well with with the political climate like it is today. So I've got a I've got a just a selfish question. I'm gonna have you put your vet hat on for me. Don't bill me after this. My dog is eight. Should I consider getting him clipped for prostate issues to kind of curb that? I mean, you know, there's there's several testosterone dependent um issues, but you know, most guys that are hunters don't. Um, we do see perianal adenomas, prostatic disease, testicular tumors, all that. Um, and but generally, on those testosterone-driven deals, you know, if you neuter them and address it, then it'll usually go away. Like our most common prostate problems, benign prostatic hyperplasia. And so if you put them on antibiotics and neuter them normally, <clears throat> it takes care of that, you know. Dogs just don't live as long as us, you know what I mean? So they don't tend to have a lot of the prostatic neoplasms like we do because we live so long. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a laundry list of things that, you know, if it was just a couch potato pet, you're, you're way better off neutering them than you are having them intact. So you think as, a, as him being a hunting dog – his testosterone and having his cojones attached to him might be better off than not. Well, I don't think it'll make any difference to his drive or anything like that. But if you, if you neuter him, he's gonna, his uh, metabolism's going to change. You know, you're going to, he's going to want to eat more weight, lose muscle mass, all that stuff. Now, is this just a, is this just a wives tale? But they, they say if a dog is neutered as a puppy, that he might not have the drive. Is that just a wives tale? Yeah, man. No, I don't think that. I don't think that it really affects their drive that much, personally. But it definitely affects their appearance and, and to some degree, their physical ability. I mean, you can you can pretty much tell an intact male, and for that matter, female, um, just looking at them when it comes to retrievers, especially labs where they don't have a big fuzzy coat or anything. Uh, you know, one that's altered and one that's not. Now, how my dog has, uh, he's a hes a lard ass. He's got hypothyroidism. And for a long time, I joked that he had a thyroid problem because he put on weight real bad in the offseason and then sure as shit took him to the vet. Jeff would always make fun of me because I had a fat dog in the offseason. But he really does. He's got a thyroid condition. C- it, can that affect his longevity at all? Or is that not? I mean, it's medicated now. Well, I mean, if you supplement them, then no, not really. You know, it it it, it fixes that. Good. Yeah. Jeff's giving me hell all the time. Like, oh, I'm worried about your dog. He's eight and he's got a thyroid condition. He's ready to put him in the freaking ground. I'm like, I, I give him medicine. The dog <laughs> retrieves a thousand birds a year or more. He's he's big. He's bulky. He runs. He's got a lot of energy. He's going to have hip problems and stuff. And you keep that weight off of him. Oh yeah. I mean, there's no doubt they did. Karina did a lifespan study on a couple different, like, you know, dogs that were free fed, dogs that were kept at an ideal body condition score, all that. And the dogs that were kept at the ideal body condition score by feeding lived an average of two years longer than the dogs that were allowed to be overweight. Unbelievable. Thanks a lot, Ira. Now you just put my, you put a whole lot of crap on my plate. Sure, is that generally, the bigger dogs in a breed are, the, the shorter their lifespan is and the more problems they have as a general rule. So, like, you know, you got a 100-pound lab, you're just asking for problems, orthopedic, all kinds of problems, and they're not going to live as long as a 60-pounder. As a you know, they're just 
those dogs just don't have many problems and they live a long time unless something, you know, answer or whatever gets them. What's the oldest lab you've seen? Oh, man. You know, gee, even 17 would be old. It'd be old. I, I'm sure I've seen them older than that, but, uh, you know, your average sp- lifespan for labs, 13, young, young side of 13 probably. That'd be pretty good. I mean, you know, we'll see them 15, 16 pretty often, but, you know, they're they're certainly not doing much. You, you can just bank on, on a smaller lab being able to produce in the field day in, day out for – Man, you know that tenth year, they're they're pretty well. They're not an everyday dog for sure. Even the even the best. When, of when I was a kid, I was luckily I was around a lot of good field trial dogs, and my dad was in the dog business, and I got to be around San Joaquin Honcho, who was one of the greatest field trial dogs of all time. And he was, I think, he was seventeen or eighteen when he died, and you know he belonged to a vet. Ed, Ed Acock was his. They owned him. He's a vet. Oh. But that dog was solid white or gray by the. I remember as a kid when he was fourteen or fifteen, probably, and I'd never seen a black lab that was gray the whole body. Oh man, I had one old breaking Maisie. We called her for a reason, um, and she turned gray at like six. She looked like a daggum <laughs> silverback gorilla. <laughs> but uh, but no, I mean eighteen is that's really old for a lab. You know that. That would not be something that I would tell people to expect for sure. I don't know that I'd want my dog to live to be eighteen. Yeah, my get, my marriage, healthy. my marriage, it's banking on uh, him checking out here in another yeah, three and, or four years. Andy's wife's not a fan, a fan of the dog. They don't get along. I I think he's a virgin still, so he likes to go sniffing for underwear. And when he gets in a real bad bind, he'll start sniffing for my underwear. So there's been a lot of conversations in my household. Because <laughs> oh, I'm not, I'm not of the kind. Uh, I like. He saves me a lot of steps. He's a worker for me, and I want to make sure he's a. You know, sure. I want to make sure he's got a nice bed in the house, and I take care of him. And I don't want to just, uh, you know, banish him to the backyard during the off season. So I got to stick up for the dog. Nobody else will. Well, you know, in today's world, so many of us are are like that. Where you know our our hunting partner is a partner every day of the year, you know, and, uh, I, I feel like that's becoming more and more commonplace than back in the day, mm-hmm. which I'm not saying that, it, I mean, obviously there've been people that have been that way, but I feel like just having kennel dogs that are your hunting dogs that live in the kennel and spend all their time in the kennel and all that. I just feel like that's not as common uh, as it used to be. I you think, know? I think a lot of that has to do with, we've, we've gotten softer as a society and, you know, I think back in the day, I think guys were just like, oh, hell, he's, he's just a tool. That's all he is to me. And just put him in the backyard to live out his summer months. But, you know, I like having the guy. He's, he's other than pulling out an occasional pair of underwear, he's not too bad to live with. He sheds a lot. That'll cost you. I mean, I don't know if you've had to have surgery done or if you've, if he's always passed them, but, uh, we take a lot of underwear out of dogs. I've seen some <laughs> big hair, all the way from thongs to uh, something you can jump out of the plane with. Oh, granny panties. <laughs> oh, oh One time I was like, what in the heck is this? I thought it was a daggum bed sheet. <laughs> underwear. I was like, oh, my. Uh, no, he's, he's, uh, never, he's never eaten them, but he gets them out and, you know, just – does whatever he does to him. <laughs> and he's nasty. We'll be at, like, Goose Camp because we've also got a place up in Oklahoma. And when, like, he's been away from Mama for a while, he'll start sniffing through my – because, you know, I just got my clothes strung out oh. everywhere. And you can hear him clicking his teeth. Okay. He's pervert. a pervert. That's all that it is. And I don't know I don't know if it's because he's never gotten uh, never gotten laid or what it is. But he- No, I think maybe. You ought to put up a kennel. I, I probably would if I had a dog like that. Oh, God, I hope she doesn't listen. To this this dog is spoiled rotten. Andy was out of town the other day, and Andy told me, he said, uh, if he, he likes to watch Andy Griffith, so just leave it on the TV when you go to the house and feed him, and that way he got something to watch when he's there by himself. It's See, that's what I'm dealing with. It sues him. <laughs> it sues him. Um, 
so yeah, he's eight. So I, I'm really hoping if I can get, cause he does, he's, he's the 80, 90 pound dog. I'm hoping if I can get another two years out of him, um, be good. it'll be good. Yeah, be but good. so, so what, what's the most common, I mean, when you got into the vet world, I, I mean, it's got to, as a hunter, seeing somebody bringing their dog into you for its last days. I mean, that's got to be, that's kind of got to tug at you as a hunter, knowing how close we are to our animals. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, you know, euthanasia is a blessing and a curse. Uh, you know, we're, we're lucky to be able to put them to sleep with some dignity um, instead of having them do all the stuff people do with hospice and, you know, dragging it out to the very end. So I look at that as a is something that we're very lucky to do in, in the veterinary field. But at the same time, you know, it, it's tough. It isn't tough because of the dog. It's tough because of the people. I mean, the dog, he doesn't have all of the knowledge and feelings and emotional baggage that a person does, right? He's just laying there happy somebody's petting him. And, I mean, he doesn't know he's getting neutered, put to sleep, whatever, you know. But But for us, it's hard because we have all of those emotional thoughts and so you know it's difficult to deal with some of the people you know when the times come and they're struggling with their emotions and feelings and all that stuff that it's time to put their old buddy to sleep what and honestly that, that goes to whether it's a daggum chihuahua or a pit bull or a labrador or whatever you know um but you always have to remember that it takes a lot of courage for somebody to make that decision and come through those doors and say, hey, it's time to put my dog to sleep. So, you know, I try, I'm always supportive and look at it really as an honor to be able to help them salvage some dignity for their pet versus having that pet continue to suffer or be miserable or whatever the case may be. So you just got to remember that even though it's tough for us as people to deal with it emotionally, you know, we're, we're lucky to be able to do that for our clients and for our patients. Do they ever look to you for, uh, you know, that kind of, that nudge in that direction of should I, or should I not, uh, put my dog to sleep? Yeah, they do. I mean, you know, I just try to help coach them through it and show them the path and, and be objective and tell them, you know, the two things that really, the only two things that matter in the end is what's your interpretation of the quality of life of your pet? And then what is the emotional state of mind of the family? You know, those are the only two things that matter. And then see, I look at my dog as like, he's, he's a mile marker for me. I, I got my wife and I, we were newlyweds at the time. We'd only been married four or five months and we bought our first house and brought kids home to him. And that, that's kind of how I will always look at my dog as, he was there when I started. He was there when I kind of kicked off into the person that I am now. So that's what's going to be tough, I think, when it comes time. Oh, oh yeah, and then, you know, they'll be the next one. And so how uh, old are you, Andy? So I'm 51 now. And so, I mean, you can talk to any of us older guys that are waterfowl hunters, and it's like, okay, well, there goes another decade. You know, you you think back, and your decades are defined by which dog you <laughs> had during that period of time. They're just like kids. They're all different, and, and they have their good – well, they're just like people. They have their, their strong points and their weak points and the things that make them special and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, that's what makes a dog – fun not that you keep them all i mean some of them just don't make the cut or whatever but um yeah you only get so many dogs i just uh i'm worried i'm that he's gonna be my only one that turns out worth a shit that's now, what i'm most worried about uh the next one will be he'll he'll uh, always be better than he is when he's dead <laughs> <laughs> that's true but no i bet you'll have one that's as good or better i, I tell you a story one old you know, I've hunted with, of course, through years of guiding, I've hunted with a lot, a lot of people. And I, one of my favorite old guys that I used to guide all the time, he uh, one day we're in the blind, he goes, son, let me tell you something. He goes, a man only gets one good dog and one good woman in his lifetime. Me, I've had two good dogs. <laughs> uh, 
a lot of truth to that. I just, I, where you guided up and down the flyway. You you went to Alaska, didn't you? I mean, you've been everywhere guiding. Yeah, but up there, I was just jacking around, you know, having fun. I was up there a couple different times and shot a caribou, killed a harlequin duck with a rock, uh, caught bajillions of fish and all that. But most of my guiding has been in Missouri. I mean, I've hunted all over, but most of my guiding has been in Missouri for waterfowl, and then I guided some in Kansas for turkeys. But, uh, but yeah, you know, when we first started Habitat Flats, I guided a lot in the beginning. I mean, none of us had any money. We didn't have any guides. We, we were wearing a lot of hats and doing it all. You yeah, know? that's it. Talk about the ultimate success story in the, in the waterfowl world. Habitat Flats is, is right up there. What you guys, what y'all have built that into is really amazing. It is. I mean, it is an American success story because none of us had any money. I mean, we had a little bit of ground and uh, we all had a little bit of ground and we just kind of pulled everything together and utilized our resources and did some creative negotiating. And uh, man, it's just, that's yeah, pretty cool. All How did out. you start with, uh, with Mo Marsh? Uh, well, um, I graduated vet school and went to Higginsville, Missouri, and I was friends with uh, the uh, university extension agent there, who was kind of a eccentric guy, liked duck hunt, so did I, and uh, he was building like some kayaks for hunting some of the public areas, and so we kind of started modifying those and all that, so for a long time, all Mo Marsh did was build marsh boats that really kind of pole boats for, you know, getting from point A to point B, getting all your gear there, and then being able to hide and hunt out of it and then get back. There's a lot of that style of, of hunting in, in the Midwest, and less now probably that, you know, we've developed all these other products, but um, that's what it was for, I started it in 98, and we started building those boats in 95, and so that's all we did until maybe... 2010 and then i started tinkering around with some other you know metal fab soft cut and sew stuff and then 2013 was when uh i brought the uh invisichair and invisilab to the market and then that's when we kind of started changing the whole deal a little bit you know so have you always kind of been the 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 tinkerer and the and the guy that could manufacture things uh well i mean you know i always carved my own decoys and did a lot of all that kind of stuff. I mean, I used to, before kids, I used to do all kinds of crazy stuff. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I was always looking for a better way, like a lot of us are, you know. It just all, I think for me, I had a vision of what I, what I wanted, but I also, I guess, had the organization to put together a list of like 20 items that were on my wish list in my pipe and and i went to a guy who was capable of helping me kind of develop that stuff and so i just started picking off the ones that i thought were you know the ones that were going to be the easiest and the most important and started with those and then of course once you get into it then your eyes start opening to other things and all that stuff but uh you know it, it's 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 been kind of a game changer i mean really if you think about it there was no aquatic portable small on the x mobile uh type of system for for aquatic environments i mean we had layout blinds for for hunting fields but there was nothing really like that um for hunting water you know yeah. it it amazes me how dumb i am because you figure i do this seven days a week as a guide you figure i'd come up with something that would make my life a little bit easier but i'm such a nimrod i can't come up with anything that's going to make my life or any other waterfowl hunter's life any easier oh uh, you know and then there were there were some too in all fairness where guys came to me and said hey i've got this idea and you know the the one like the invisible chair my buddy baird came to me with that and then uh, the ramp stand guy named Chris May came to me with that. Now they were rough. Yeah. I mean, they were 
pretty dysfunctional. I mean, nothing you could really use. So we spent a lot of money and time and effort into getting it all fine tuned and all that. But, um, you know, I mean, hell, waterfowlers are passionate, man. I have people contact me all the time with all kinds of ideas. Some are good, some are bad, some are crazy, some you'd probably die <laughs> in. But, you know, I mean, water, waterfowlers are a passionate group. So it's not like old Ira is the only one out there thinking about how he can do something better or kill more stuff or keep his dog safer or whatever, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting to talk to all these people for sure. I bet you do get some doozies of ideas thrown your way. Hey. Oh yeah. I think, I think a lot of the people that are in the game, like, I mean, the Higdon guy, I'm, you know, obviously I'm friends with them and I'm friends with Cody Stokes with Dive Bomb. And we talk about some of the stuff that people bring to us and, you know, some of the things are interesting and some of them are like, oh my goodness, no way. Yeah, we we had a situation like that because we have a very good relationship with Dive Bomb. They sponsor the podcast and we hunt with them several times a year and we just, we had a guy. We we had a, a and he was, he was a friend of a friend and he had an idea and I don't like being the middleman and it's kind of like, I don't, I mean, I don't think it's really going to work. But he was just adamant to get in front of the guys at Dive Bomb. This will change the way they do business. It's just like, uh, I think you better go back to the drawing board there. But it's tough being the bad man, guy. thinks that their idea is the greatest there, there ever was, you know. And I mean, it, it's interesting being on both sides of the deal and having all the tools and all that stuff. It, it really has always kind of blown my mind that, you know, something that I think is going to be easy to produce and something that is going to have a high profit margin and easy to bring to market and accepted by the community and all those things. I mean, you just never know. I mean, some of the things that seem really easy or super hard to do and other things that you think are going to be really hard to do or really easy to do. And then some of the things that you just believe that the community is going to embrace and love, they really don't you know, just fall in love with and then other things that you're like, eh, I don't know. I mean, it's whatever. It's, it's not anything earth shattering. People are like, Oh my God, they can't get enough of it. You know? So you, you don't ever really know until you bring something to market or go through the whole process. And it's amazing how many times what I've thought and expected hadn't really panned out, you know, what, uh, what's coming up next for, for Mo Marsh. We got any new products that you can, let us in on here we do um some that probably aren't quite ready some that are definitely not ready um we're working on a lot of stuff the vest was new last year it had a few issues we're we're addressing those some were material issues some were construction issues uh so we're gonna revamp that make some updates modification material changes um so it's going to be improved for sure. Uh, and then we just brought bumpers out, um, and we've got another round of bumpers coming that are going to be something different and kind of novel to the market. Um, and then, you know, it's probably, I don't know, the biggest thing we have coming, I probably can't quite say yet just because it's not 100% dialed in. But we should have a new and exciting major product to the market for the fall. But I can't quite say. Yeah. We appreciate you uh, bringing some clarity on that issue. <laughs> uh, yeah. Before we let you, Both yeah, sign yeah. Before we let you go, we've kept you an hour now. Why don't you use uh, turkey decoys? Uh, man, they're just one more thing to screw yeah. you up. Um, I mean, I've had so many tur turkeys through the years that have either hung up on them, you know, they see them, they know they're in a better spot, they know you should come to them, and it's not going to happen. Uh, and then, you know, it's something else you got to pack around. It's something you got to, you know, like when you're running and gunning mm -hmm. a lot, it's something you've got to try to put out in front of you, between you and that turkey. And some of the time you're going to get busted doing that. Um, and then it's something else you got to pick up when you're done and you're wanting to move again. So I just, I think back through the years and think about the turkeys that I would have killed without one and the turkeys that I wouldn't have killed without one. 
And I think that, in my opinion, for the place I hunt, I'm better off not using them than I am using them. I think most of those turkeys I'm going to kill with one, I'm going to kill without one. Makes sense enough to me. Uh, we really appreciate your time. I know you're a busy, busy man right now, but uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And uh, good luck this coming waterfowl season. Hopefully Canada's open and everything's back to normal. Well, same thing to you guys. If we talk again, we'll get around to talking about uh, Habitat Flats kennels. That's our. That's kind of our newest. I think we just moved dogs in there like 10 days ago. So uh, that chapter is yet to be written, but it, it, started. it has started. I've seen that, and that looks uh, it looks like an exciting new uh, new chapter for you guys. No doubt in my mind you guys will kill it. Yep. Well, Ira, we appreciate it. God bless you, and um, have a great summer. All right, good luck with your dogs, fellas. Right, you thank too. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Ira McCauley. Well, he gets to go to a lot of cool places. Yeah, he does. Got a cool life. For sure. What are you looking at me for? Are we still on there? Yeah. Oh, well, you pushed a button. I didn't know if we were or not. All right. Well, I guess we're done for the week, huh? That's it. Yep. Thank you all for listening to us. Uh, we'll have Matt Peel on with Goose Creek Retrievers, and uh, that'll be our next podcast. Thank you all, and God bless you all. Have a great day. Check out all of our sponsors. Check out Goose Creek Retrievers, like Jeff just said. Check out uh, Banktail Whiskey, Stanford Hunting Outfitters, Gundog Outdoors, Dive Bomb Industries, Pacific Calls, Blind Grass, Boss Shot Shells, Dirty Duck Coffee, Looking Glass Duck Club, and Lucky Duck.